الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الخلق سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Hello everyone, my name is Lujain Nasif, Venture Lab Manager at Prince Mohammed bin Salman College for Business and Entrepreneurship located in King Abdullah Economic City. Welcome everyone, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to a unique historic Global Entrepreneurship Monitor event held in Saudi Arabia. And it is hosted in partnership by Prince Mohammed bin Salman College and Babson Global uh, Center for Entrepreneurship Leadership located at the Prince Mohammed bin Salman College, as well as being co-hosted by Munshaat. Tonight's event is historic in the fact that it is the first ever virtual event hosted in Saudi Arabia. Oh, first ever global entrepreneurship monitor event hosted in Saudi Arabia. It's also the first time that we will be launching not one, but two reports. The fourth national KSA report and the first ever women's entrepreneurship report. Now, before we begin, I would like to remind our esteemed audience zooming from all over the world that you can use the chat box to communicate amongst each other. However, if you have any questions for our researchers, speakers, or panelists, please use the Q&A section, and we will do our best to address them during Q&A segments or dedicated segments throughout the event. Now, without any further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Zager de Graaf, the Dean of Prince Mohammed bin Salman College, to give his opening remarks. Thank you very much, Rutain. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pleasure to warmly welcome you to Prince Mohammed bin Salman College of Business and Entrepreneurship and the launch of the fourth annual Global Entrepreneurship Monitor Saudi Arabia report. Actually, thank you very much for your massive interest and attendance. Um, just looking, there are 283 and counting attendees this event right now. I am Zeger de Graaf. I am the Dean of Prince Mohammed bin Salman College for about one year now. And since that time, we have embarked on a strategy of unrelenting pursuit of world-class quality and business development. And I'm very proud to say that we are launching our new pre-experience master in management in a couple of weeks. Both Global Entrepreneurship Monitor Saudi Arabia reports come at a pivotal junction when change makers within the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia are addressing unprecedented challenges of a global pandemic. While these versions of the GEM reports do not reflect the consequent causal effect of the outbreak upon the region, they do reflect and impress upon how entrepreneurship and the relevant ecosystem within the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has continued to develop and is now primed to draw upon the region's Vision 2030 fueled transformative expensive reality for the economy. Since its inception, our school, MPSC, located in Cake, has played a significant role in promoting entrepreneurship as the preeminent institution for entrepreneurship and innovation education in the country. Focused on cultivating thought leadership, and the next generation of entrepreneurially minded business executives for the region, MBSC has aligned itself with Saudi's Vision 2030 agenda to foster value creating initiative and entrepreneurship throughout the kingdom. To that effect, the school's Venture Lab offers entrepreneurial ventures a launch pad to incubate or accelerate within Saudi Arabia and beyond. It is my pleasure to thank our partners, the MISC Foundation, Lockheed Martin, Babson Global, IMAR, the Economic City, our partner for the forum here, Monjahad, and of course, 
Prince Mohammed bin Salman College are a team of faculty and researchers. All the partners and stakeholders whose generosity, unwavering support and intellectual contributions have made the timely publication of these GEM reports possible. Again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your massive interest and attendance. Dr. Zeger. And now I would like to welcome Mr. David Abdal, President and CEO of Babson Global, joining us all the way from Boston. Welcome, Mr. David. Thank you, Jane. I'm David Abdow. I'm CEO for Babson Global and Director of the Babson Global Center for Entrepreneurial Leadership. It's my pleasure to join with Jane and Zager, and you will hear from shortly Vice Governor Assam, and welcome you to this year's <clears throat> Saudi Arabia GEM Forum. Uh, established several years ago at MBSC in collaboration with Amar, the Economic City, and Lockheed Martin under the umbrella of Saudi Arabia's Economic Offset Program, the Babson Global Center for Entrepreneurial Leadership has a mission to promote a sustainable entrepreneurship ecosystem in Saudi Arabia. It does this through entrepreneurship research, education, and outreach, and I'm pleased to say that GEM has been one of the center's most important initiatives since its founding. GEM is, uh, so just a few words about GEM, it is one of the world's foremost studies of entrepreneurship. It began in 1999 as a joint project between Babson College and the London Business School with a goal of building understanding as to why some economies are perceived to be more entrepreneurial than others. Through a highly coordinated international data collection effort, GEM has provided high quality information on a comprehensive variety of entrepreneurship indicators in 114 economies over 21 years. GEM's become a trusted resource for governments and organizations around the world to help inform decision-making to improve the quantity and quality of entrepreneurship activity. This year's GEM National Report for Saudi Arabia, as you've heard, represents the fourth consecutive year in which GEM has tracked the multiple phases, motivations, and attitudes in Saudi society toward entrepreneurship. We are thrilled to see the year-over-year -year progress across many indicators and hope that the report may help to inform decision-making and actions to continuously improve conditions, the conditions that enable entrepreneurship to thrive. We're also thrilled to be releasing the very first women's report for Saudi Arabia. This report, which was produced in collaboration with Munshad and the World Bank, provides a comprehensive profile of women's entrepreneurship and includes comparisons by gender of attitudes, perceptions, affiliations, and profiles of entrepreneurs. Uh, the report highlights where areas where women entrepreneurs have made significant progress and areas where challenges and opportunities remain. Uh, I would like to close by adding my thanks to our GEM sponsors and partners as well. MBSC, of course, MISC, Munshat, uh, the World Bank, and Lockheed Martin. And finally, thank you so much to our report authors. Dr. Mohammed Rumi from MBSC, Dr. Donna Kelly from Babson College, and Dr. Alicia Koderis from, from the GEM Consortium. Thank you very much for your interest in making the time and enjoy the rest of the forum. And thank you for being with us all the way from Boston. <laughs> My pleasure. Next, I would like to welcome the Vice Governor of Entrepreneurship at Munshaat, Mr. Asam al -Dikir. event uh, all of it, uh, it will be in English. Good evening uh, everyone on behalf of uh, His Excellency Engineer Saleh Rashid and all Munshaat employees I would like to thank you to be uh, Munshaat be part of this great event. Uh, inter entrepreneurship uh, changing the world economy, improving our daily life, developing our community, creating new jobs, discovering a new market. To know where we are standing compared to the rest of the world, we need a periodic solid report such as Jim Report to understand the point of strengths, weaknesses in the entrepreneurship ecosystem. At Munshaat, we are very glad to be part of this report and standing together with Babson College and MBSC 
and we are looking forward for more cooperation to improve the entrepreneurship ecosystem in the kingdom. Mr. Dad, University Startups, Pumuh, Startup Saudi, and Saudi Venture Company, all of it, are, and many more Munshaat initiatives and achievements was mentioned in the global report, which means that Munshaat is one of the main player in the entrepreneurship ecosystem in the kingdom. We are aiming to increase our contribution from small and medium enterprise to GDP from 20% to 35%. And to reach this by year 2030, creating jobs to achieve our vision of the 2030 target. Taking the indicators and framework of contribution of Jim report will help us to monitor our progress and achieve our goal fast. The methodology of Jim, uh, the methodology of Jim report that considering the expert and public opinion is offering a view from different perspectives. We are in Munshaat, we do believe in the value of this report and we support the effort to set clear image of the entrepreneurship among the world countries. The National Entrepreneurship Context Index, NECI, developed by Jim was very helpful tools to discover the gap and the areas of improvement. Also, NECI, summarizing the framework, conditions and ecosystem indicators and the score and ranking, which help the policymakers to diagnose the problem and challenge. Last but not least, we would like to thank the Babson, the Babson College, uh, the Babson Global Center for Entrepreneurship Leadership, Prince Mohammed bin Salman College, CAKE, and the Research Innovation Advisory Committee. Finally, uh, we believe that Saudi Arabia will face the entrepreneurship ecosystem for future. Together, we can achieve something that have not and never been achieved before. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. al Mr. Abdo, and Dr. DeGraff. Now, uh, for, sorry, for your welcoming notes and opening speeches, getting us all excited and intrigued to learn more about what is happening in Saudi Arabia in terms of entrepreneurship. And now, without any further delay, I would like to present to you uh, Dr. Muhammad Azam Rumi, a professor of entrepreneurship and the founding dean of faculty, research, and executive education at MBSC, who has also been the team leader for Gem Case A since 2016. He has a passion for helping entrepreneurs grow their businesses and preaches about entrepreneurial thought and action, which he practices through establishing entrepreneurial ventures being an angel investor and an avid benefactor of entrepreneurial ecosystems in multiple countries. I would like to also welcome Professor Alicia Kuduras, who is joining us all the way from Spain. Professor Kuduras has been teaching over 20 years and is an expert in quantitative methods and project management. Professor Kuduras has been working for JAM for many years and is the technical director of the Saudi Arabia team and as a member of the GEM Global Data team. Dr. Rumi and Dr. Kuduras will be shedding some light on the findings, changings, and advances related to the Saudi entrepreneurial ecosystem. Welcome, Dr. Rumi. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, um, my name is Mohammed Rumi and I am uh, uh, professor of Entrepreneurship and on behalf of Global Entrepreneurship Monitor Saudi Arabian team, I welcome you all to 2019-2020 GEM KSA Forum. As you know that this is the fourth consecutive year of conducting GEM survey in the kingdom. Before I indulge into this year's report, findings, I would like to introduce briefly about Global Entrepreneurship Monitor. Uh, 
Global Entrepreneurship Monitor is an annual assessment of entrepreneurial activity at the national level in multiple diverse countries. After 21 years of in its inception, it started in 1999, GEM is now the largest ongoing study of entrepreneurial dynamics in the world. And it has become the foremost global on, uh, authority on global entrepreneurship for policy, education, and practitioner audiences as well. Now, uh, if uh, you look at the unique aspects of GEM, basically it's focus on entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship uh, in a cross-national and longitudinal way. Cross-national means that you can compare one country with the other country as well. For example, this year we are saying that Saudi Arabia ranks third in the government support for entrepreneurship out of 54 economies which we have uh, conducted the survey. But you can look at longitudinal comparison as well. You can look at it that how and where we were as Saudi Arabians in 2016 and how we have improved or not improved during the last four years. Uh, when I look at it from Saudi Arabian's perspective, I can see that government policies, support and uh, relevance has improved 40% from 2017 to 2019. So two things which I can know while looking at the GEM findings is I can compare my country with the other countries of the world. And at the same time, I can also see that how I can compare my own performance as compared to the previous years. Now, um, if you, I'm sorry, I have, apologies if we can just have a couple of seconds while we deal with this technical issue. It's okay. So now what uh, I, I am, I hope that you can see me because uh, the, my screen was blank. So I thought that you, ca you cannot hear me, but now I think you can hear me as well. I can hear you, Dr. Rumi. Okay, perfect. Excellent. So basically uh, what Jem is trying to find out, Jem is trying to find out the total entrepreneurial activity in a country and it's total early stage entrepreneurial activity, which means that we also want to see that what is nascent entrepreneurship, which means that how, what is the attitude of people in involving into the businesses, number one. Or number two, that the businesses which have already been started up to 3.5 years, three and a half years, how they are performing. Are they going to become established businesses or they discontinue? Uh, during that process. So while we are, when we are looking at it, we are looking at three different things. We are looking at entrepreneurial attributes or attitudes. For example, we are looking at uh, gender, age, motivation of different entrepreneurs. We also want to look at the industry or sector, in which sector people are uh, opening up their businesses. And we also want to know the impact of those businesses on economic growth, on other uh, impact, uh, other uh, areas uh, of which can indicate a country's economic growth. So, uh, if I cannot, uh, so for for this year, uh, there were forty four economies uh, which were there to uh, which participated in this uh, global entrepreneurship monitor all over the world. And out of those uh, 54 economies, those 54 economies are basically divided into different regions. 
There was an Asia and Pacific region, Europe and North America, Latin America and Caribbean, and Middle East and Africa. We, as Saudi Arabians, were in Middle East and Africa, which has Middle East and North, North Africa, uh, and in addition to South Africa and Morocco. Now, all these countries have been divided into three categories. Either they are low-income categories, or middle income or high income. Like in our Middle East and Africa, Egypt and Morocco were low income uh, countries. Iran was a middle income uh, country, whereas UAE, Qatar, uh, Saudi Arabia, and Oman were high income categories. Now, what we are trying to find out that there are, that whether entrepreneurship is growing or not. And when we are looking at gro growth of entrepreneurship in a country, we are looking at six possible uh, indicators or the factors. The first one is that there is a surety that the participation as far as entrepreneurship is concerned is, is across all the phases. We also wanted to see that whether there is a boost in entrepreneurship's overall impact on economy or not. We also wanted to see that there, there the support is access to all the groups in society, for example, gender or, or diversity or the races, the people who are uh, coming from different backgrounds. Then the fourth one was developing positive attitudes and inspiration about entrepreneurship. And the fifth one was fostering entrepreneurial talent and stakeholders of entrepreneurs. And the sixth one is building national conditions that support entrepreneurs. So these were the six areas which were basically studies, which was surveyed. These were surveyed by real entrepreneurs or people who wanted to start the business or people who had started the business. And there were 4,000 of them in Saudi Arabia. And in addition to that, we also surveyed national experts, people who were part and parcel of the entrepreneurial ecosystem. So basically, we wanted to ask a number of questions from them as well to see that how we are performing as far as uh, the economy is concerned, as far as entrepreneurship is concerned. The first thing which we were looking at is basically to ensure that there is participation across all phases. And as you know, that the phases were intentions, the first one, that somebody is thinking about going into the business. The second one is total entrepreneurial activity, early stage entrepreneurial activity. And then after that, either the companies grow or they discontinue. So we wanted to see across all these phases. So if you look at this graph, it is basically telling us that during the last four years, how we have performed in longitudinally. The first one, is intentions. And you can see the intention rate is quite high. Uh, it started from 25.8% and now in 2000, 2019, it is 35.7%. Whereas total entrepreneurial activity is lower. It is at par with a number of other countries, but it is lower than intentions. So it is quite normal because more people, they decide to go into the business, but whether they are able to embark upon these businesses is a total different uh, ball game. So we wanted to know that what are the constraints, why they did not go into that kind of uh, uh, entrepreneurial activity. The second thing which we wanted to know, as I told you, that how many of those have transferred into established businesses? So the numbers are even lower. You can see that 5.4% as compared to 14% total entrepreneurial activity. And it is quite understandable as well, because not all the businesses, they go and get established, which means that they don't go into the growth phase. The total picture looks like this. You can see that intentions are high, 
total entrepreneurial activity is at par, but not as high as intentions. On the other hand, the third category, the growth oriented businesses, the businesses which were able to establish are even lower. And that lower number has certain reason because some of the businesses, they discontinued. Why? We asked those reasons as well. And we found out that 39.5% of the businesses, they discontinued because they thought that the government policies or bureaucracy was hindering them. 14.6% of the businesses discontinued because they were unprofitable. And then 7.6% because of the finance problems. Now, this is quite low as compared to other countries where financing is an issue, but not that high an issue in Saudi Arabia. This was our finding. What was the motivation to start those businesses? The motivation to start those businesses usually was necessity-based. So you can see that yellow bar, which is telling us that they started a business to earn a living because jobs are scarce. Or the orange bar, which is telling us to build a great wealth for a high income. So primarily, uh, the reason was to make money. As far as the making a difference in the world or to continue a family tradition is concerned, we were at par with MENA region, other countries as well but those were lower than having money. The money was one of the motivation factors. Now, if you look at the second box, which is boosting entrepreneurship's overall impact on economy, where does Saudi Arabia stand? So we came to know that most of the businesses, 72% businesses are in highest level of consumer-oriented activity. Now, consumer-oriented businesses are very easy to join, but once you join them, the, the, the competition is cutthroat because, uh, the, because the competition is cutthroat and the margin levels are low. That's why sometimes, those, uh, most of the times, those businesses do not dis uh, continue. They are unable to survive because they are not there because of their uniqueness, because something new, something different. They are there because it's easy for them to be in that field. So this was one of the reasons. But extractive uh, uh, area, and now extractive area is your technology area, where the businesses come on the basis of medium to high level of technology. And that's where the number of businesses are only 1.3%, very low. But they are low all over the world. Even in the US, they are not that high. But here in Saudi Arabia, we found out that technology-oriented businesses are very low. And this is one of the areas where we need to work on. This is one of the areas where we need some effort. Current number of employees, you can see these graphs that, yes, uh, total entrepreneurial uh, activity, there are 24%, one to five jobs, and 57%, six to nine percent jobs. Um, we asked them, that what are the growth expectations as far as employees are concerned in the next five years? And 87.5% of them uh, basically came back to us that uh, um, entrepreneurs said that, yes, we want to have more employees. Whereas established businesses, only 30% of established business owners said that we will have more employees. Now it explains something because total people who are in the early phases of their entrepreneurial activity, maybe they don't know the consequences as yet. Maybe they, are, they still have that passion alive, but those established business owners, they are a bit careful. They have been there, they have gone through it. They know all the problems and issues and challenges. So they, they, their expectations or their, um, uh, their, their wish is limited. It's more practical, more hands-on as compared to uh, others. Now, uh, market scope, if you look at the market scope, 26% uh, of entrepreneurs uh, will have uh, customers outside, whereas um, uh, newness in the market, 88.6% of entrepreneurs were not introducing any new products or services and 86.8% were not using any new technologies. 
Now, this is something which we have to think about because new technologies increase the innovativeness, global competitiveness, and sustainability of businesses. They can be more growth-oriented businesses if there is newness in market, if there are use of new technologies, but this is not the case. Let's talk about the last, uh, third one, sorry, it's the support access to all groups in society. So you will see that the gender ratio of uh, uh, here in Saudi Arabia, the women total entrepreneurial activity was the highest in the world, 14.7% as compared to men, which is 13.4%. So, which means that during the last year or this year, more women have come for entrepreneurial activity. More women have joined the entrepreneurial arena. So it's highest male to female ratio among 54 gem uh, economies. So this is something which is very uh, encouraging for us. Um, this, and we will talk about it in detail in Women's Entrepreneurship Report. My uh, colleague, uh, Professor Donna Kelly, will uh, elaborate it further as well. But the next thing which I want to show you is age profile. Like if you look at this graph and you will see that um, the green graph shows you the situation in Egypt, for example, where young people, their total entrepreneurial activity is much higher as compared to the old people. But in our country, the red is our graph, Saudi Arabia. You will see that in, in the beginning, they are not that high, but uh, as, the work, as, as, as the life progresses, in, during the phase of 25 to 34 years, there are more entrepreneurial activity. And during 35 to 44, it's the max. And the same is the trend for um, UAE as well, if you look at it. But then it decreases over a period of time. But the maximum is during 35 to 44 years. And I don't have to explain it, the reasons, because people are more experienced, they, they know how to do it, they want to take that plunge and they have their financial capital, their social capital, and, 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 and they, their human capital is much higher as well. So that's why they come into uh, business at that stage. Now we are left with three other uh, boxes, which I showed you in earlier slides. And for that, I would like to request my colleague, uh, Dr. Alicia Kodoros, who was instrumental in finalizing this report. She is the mind who was crunching the numbers for us and helping us a lot as well. So I would like Dr. Kudoris to talk about the next three points, please. Thank you, Dr. Rumi. Salam and good evening to everyone. Uh, to start, I'm going to show you the main indicators we got on how the Saudi population develops positive attitudes and inspiration about entrepreneurship. Can you go ahead, please, with the, with the slide? Can you uh, pass the, the slide? Yes, um, yes, here, thank you. So in this chart, you can see that society-wide awareness and appreciation for entrepreneurship in Saudi Arabia is demonstrated by the high percentage of the adult population who are uh, personally acquainted with entrepreneurs who believe entrepreneurs merit high status and who respect entrepreneurship as a good career choice. So continuing to foster these positive attitudes will contribute toward ensuring that entrepreneurs build networks and receive the support they need to start and grow their businesses. So keeping strong societal values is important because as countries uh, develop, GEM have observed how these rates tend to decline, especially among young, if there is a lot of offer to become a public or private employee. In Saudi Arabia, there are small signs that uh, this process has begun, since we observe little but significant differences between genders and uh, younger versus mature age groups. The positive rates for these indicators are higher for those with at least half a post-secondary education and for those living in Daman compared to Riyadh. So the results uh, suggest that um, age, education, and territorial development matter. 
Finally, comparing with the United States, considering entrepreneurship as, as a career choice and assigning high status to successful entrepreneurs show similar rates while this country is higher on media attention. In 2019, GEM measured for the first time indicators about fostering entrepreneurship talent. The results for Saudi Arabia show that, can you please go ahead? Yeah, that almost 64% of the adult population recognizes creativity as a useful feature, while 54 of adults think that they have vision for long-term decision-making about their lives. In turn, Saudi adults look as somewhat less capable about identifying good opportunities or about taking some action on them. So this result suggests that implementing entrepreneurship um, education at school and secondary stages could improve over time the lack of alignment between creative capacity and its transition into concrete entrepreneurial actions. Now in the next slide, can you go ahead please? Uh, informal investment looks as a traditional asset in Saudi Arabia. In 2019, 50% of, uh, of adult Saudis has funded an entrepreneur. This rate increased 3% points compared to 2018 and is the highest in the MENA region in 2019. And uh, the median amount invested is around 30,000 reals. And informal investors keep most often investing in relatives, but still a lot in others one know. Can we go ahead, please? Now I'm going to summarize the MICE findings on the average state of the conditions that support entrepreneurs those uh, that are evaluated by experts. So Jam estimates the average state of these 12 pillars considered by the literature as key to synthesize the context for entrepreneurship, thanks to a national experts survey. The results we're going to see are over 10 points each. Please go ahead. Yes, so uh, in many countries, these indicators uh, show small changes from one year to the next. But in the case of Saudi Arabia, there has been a significant and positive progress on several pillars the last two years, especially on entrepreneurial finance, government policies, and government programs. So the results suggest that the continuous efforts developed by governmental institutions on regulation, investment, and all aspects linked to Vision 2030 are having a positive impact and an echo from private agents as well. So the internal market dynamics before the pandemic have increased some the room for entrepreneurs to enter the market, while physical infrastructure and cultural background remained quite similar compared to 2018. The rest of conditions, as you can see, improved some but are still considered as non-sufficient, especially entrepreneurial education at school stage. And finally, go ahead, please. <laughs> finally, comparing the average state of the pillars of the Saudi context for entrepreneurs with the GEM averages, please, the next slide, <laughs> we can see that the kingdom stands out relative to government but it is also relatively high in culture, finance, and internal market. Saudi Arabia is aligned with GEM on physical infrastructure and needs to continue improving the implementation of entrepreneurial education programs. The context also needs to improve on R&D transfer, commercial infrastructure, and internal market regulation. And that's all by my side. Now I'm going to give the word to Dr. Rumi so he can talk about the nine conclusions for the year 2019. Thank you very much for your attention. Bye. Thank you very much, um, um, uh, Alicia. The next is that what are the conclusions? What have we found as far as Saudi Arabia is concerned? And what are the recommendations? How to go forward? Now, the first thing is that, you know, that society-wide awareness 
and appreciation of entrepreneurship in Saudi Arabia is demonstrated by the high percentage of the adult population who are personally acquainted with entrepreneurs, who believe entrepreneurs merit high status and who respect entrepreneurship as a good career choice. So in that case, mentoring and role models can be key to inspire and guide entrepreneurs and can occur through a mechanism that promote personal connections and enhance the visibility of entrepreneurs to which people can relate. Additionally, we think that uh, entrepreneurs rely on a variety of stakeholders, such as customers, suppliers, investors, employees, and advisors. And continuing to foster these positive attitude will uh, attitudes will contribute toward ensuring that entrepreneurs build networks, because those networks are very important. They build those networks and receive the support they need to start and grow their businesses. That's our first conclusion, and that's our first recommendation based on that conclusion as well. The second one is addressing perceptions about fear of failure and uh, sense of starting. Because yes, a lot of people are starting businesses, but at the same time, they have a fear of failure as well. So they, there is a need to counter that fear of failure and ease for starting up is also required. And one of the, the reason uh, for discontinuing or um, closing the business is uh, bureaucracy. And if this is, the, this is the reason, then we have to identify and address the underlying reasons for these constraints and they could break down some of the barriers they, which are right now preventing a number of entrepreneurs from going to total entrepreneurial state, uh, activity stage to growth business stage. In addition to that, um, I think um, the next one is building a foundation for entrepreneurs in schools and curriculum programs in colleges. Now, you know, the impact of higher education on entrepreneurship is clearly apparent. Um, a number of uh, researchers all over the world, they have talked about it. They have done their research and they have found out that how education, entrepreneurship education, hands-on entrepreneurship education, how it can help developing the attitude at the same time intentions and then uh, foster that kind of uh, characteristics and skills which are required to go and take the first, uh, next step as well. So as far as um, uh, Saudi Arabia is concerned, a lot of work is required in uh, this uh, uh, area. Um, the next one is continue achievement in gender equality. Now, gender strides in, uh, great strides in gender uh, have been achieved by uh, Saudi Arabia, and they are highlighted in results as well, and they are showing that women are proportionately more likely to start uh, uh, businesses as compared to men right now in Saudi Arabia. This corroborates other results as well, uh, showing that compared to men, women are equally likely to know an entrepreneur and to state that they have the capabilities for starting a business they are slightly more likely to see lots of opportunity around them as compared to men as well. And uh, they also, also told us that it's easier to start business as compared to men. So there needs, uh, there's a, there are need for continued efforts that will ensure that this is a sustainable outcome. And if we are able to achieve this sustainable outcome that will definitely go a long way as far as Saudi Arabia is concerned. Um, another one is leveraging regional strengths and resources. Now the regional analysis shows more uniform participation in entrepreneurship among the cities studied in 2019. While entrepreneurship may thrive in certain areas of Saudi Arabia, there may infect the certain areas where starting as business is particularly compelling solution for boosting employment and economic growth. There are certain areas where there are more jobs as compared to other uh, areas. 
But what we have to see is that how government and private sector, they can join hands or maybe work at their own as well in to give it a regional lens and see that how entrepreneurship can be promoted in the areas where it is not as high as compared to other areas. Um, another thing um, which I have already talked about that we have to foster high growth and knowledge intensive ventures. So far, we have seen that most of the businesses are in the area which is consumer oriented area or uh, business services area where competition is cutthroat, where margins are low, where, where there are more chances uh, of uh, not surviving in the long run. So that's what we have to focus upon, that how we can help and grow uh, high growth uh, businesses, especially technology oriented businesses, though there are certain clusters, like for example, Kaust is one of the clusters from where the ideas are generating. Uh, similarly in Riyadh, there, are, there, there is a cluster where on, uh, technology oriented entrepreneurial ventures are thriving, but we need to focus on other areas as well. Um, the next one is um, innovative and global entrepreneurship. Yes, we need to go global. We need to export. We need to uh, have businesses which are taking care of the needs of bigger market, international markets, because they will then impact on the economy of the kingdom positively. And that's the area which needs encouragement. That's the area which needs help from the government uh, and from the private sector as well, from venture capital firms as well. So this is uh, one of the areas to be improved. And um, we have to work on enabling ventures to survive and grow into maturity. Um, starting a business in one area, and then growing those businesses is totally different ball games, which needs a lot of other things, uh, which needs uh, capacity building of entrepreneurs, most of the times who start their businesses because there is a necessity or they like it, but how to grow it is, uh, needs a lot of attention. Uh, a lot of programs are needed to help those entrepreneurs to develop themselves, and to develop their businesses as well, to be more competitive, to be more agile, to be more innovative. And this is the area which needs uh, a lot of attention because an entrepreneur can advance a nation's competitiveness and the comp nation's competitiveness through international commerce and innovation is only possible when we focus on those ventures to survive and grow into maturity. And uh, last but not the least, encourage networks among informal investors. Um, for, the, for the last two, three years, we are seeing a lot of growth as far as the venture capital industry is concerned here in the kingdom. I think there's a lot of room to grow and there is a lot of room to play more and more into it. Um, there is a need for informal investors to get together, to have informal networks where they can support each other, where they can be educated where to invest, how to invest, and which areas to focus upon as well. So I think these are the conclusions, and on these conclusions, we have based certain recommendations as well. And once you go through the report, you will see that we have elaborated them in detail, and we have compared ourselves not only with other countries, of the region, but internationally as well. And we have given certain examples. So I think a good read of the report will give you, explain you all these uh, 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 conclusions and recommendations which I have made. Um, this is the crux. This is the summary of the report. This is not the report. If you look at it there, you will see that a lot of things which we could not talk here you can find those in, in the report as well. The reports will be sent to all the people who have registered for uh, this webinar. And there are more than 1,300 people, I have been told, who registered for this seminar. Um, we are very thankful to our sponsors and the partners. Mohammed bin Salman College for Business and Entrepreneurship is where we are based and we are doing this research. But our major partner, Babson Global Center for Entrepreneurial Leadership, is basically 
behind it and not only financially but also intellectually as well my colleague professor donna kelly who works at babson has uh, contributed immensely in this report as well other than that we have other sponsors like lockheed martin uh, king abdullah economic city where we are based and we are also thankful to our sponsor munchaat um, the small and medium enterprise general authority in the kingdom uh, for uh, providing help at different stages of this uh, report writing. Thank you very much. Uh, we have given our email addresses. Uh, I am available if you need to ask any questions. Uh, yes, during the panel as well, but afterwards, once you read the report and you have any questions, feel free to uh, email us. I have given you the email addresses here. My email address, uh, Dr. Alicia Pedora's email address, and Dr. Donna Kelly's email addresses are there. Uh, I am the GEM team leader here in Saudi Arabia, and I would like to welcome any questions if you have any discussions, any things where we can improve together, where we can collaborate and improve the entrepreneurial ecosystem in uh, the Saudi Arabia. Uh, our leadership at Mohammed bin Salman College is very much interested uh, to collaborate and to uh, improve the entrepreneurial ecosystem so that we can realize Vision 2030. Uh, over to you, Lejane. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Rumi and Dr. Alicia for these interesting findings. In a few seconds, we will be hearing from local entrepreneurs and experts in the ecosystem to hear their opinions and experiences. Dr. Rumi, please present the panelists. Yeah, so our first uh, panelist needs no introduction. I'm sure you have had the pleasure of watching her uh, inspiring and educating young entrepreneurs as one of the sharks at uh, Shark Tank Arabia. And um, when I was going through her bio, I read that, yes, she says that she is a motivational speaker. She is an entrepreneur and investor, as well as an empathetic coach. So, yes, an empathetic shark, indeed. So I'd like to welcome Ms. Maha Khalid Teba as our first panelist. Our Thank second you, panelist, um, we have Mr. Abdul Rahman Sohemi, who is representing MISC Foundation, where he leads entrepreneurship and innovati uh, innovation initiatives and is directly responsible for helping and developing young entrepreneurs. Um, then we have uh, our next panelist, uh, who is representing Munchaat here, Mr. Muhammad Abdul Aziz Al Rifi. He is the general manager of entrepreneurship at Munchaat, where he leads the efforts to create projects enabling key ecosystem players to develop entrepreneurial mindset and entrepreneurial culture awareness across different social segments including women and youth. And the fourth one is very close to my heart because he is one of our students at uh, MBSC, Mohammed bin Salman College of Business and Entrepreneurship. But this is not the reason that he is here right now. The reason he is here now is he is an excellent entrepreneur and he has shown agility, skills, and steadfastness in the time of COVID-19. I have been following him for the last one and a half year and handholding him during that time. And he is creating a new world for his customers with most beautiful pieces of furniture. So you just think about COVID-19 and you say, who will, who will buy furniture in while COVID-19 is happening? So we will hear from him. Uh, we will ask him a number of questions and we will hear from him his story and his entrepreneurial journey as well. So thank you very much, all four of you, uh, that you are here uh, on our request. My first question is from Maha. Maha, uh, as you are an empathetic shark, uh, I would like to ask that um, our gem findings shows that there is an increase in participation in entrepreneurship in the kingdom. In your opinion, what is driving that increase? 
Well, thank you, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, it's first of all, it's a pleasure to be with all of you, and um, I'm very uh, privileged to be on this distinguished panel with uh, MBSC. Um, I think that there are many reasons why we have uh, seen uh, recent uh, engagement of entrepreneurs within this uh, very exciting arena in Saudi Arabia. I think that uh, probably hands down, one of the main reasons why we see more entrepreneurs joining is the conscious decision of the Saudi government to actually reform this ecosystem. And this reform is coming uh, from the drive of Vision 2030. We do want as a country to diversify away from oil. Uh, we see a lot of clarity through the vision. Frankly, everybody has now been given a game plan to really understand where to focus. Everybody knows in Saudi that, for example, the sports industry, the entertainment industry, tourism is on top of the list. So entrepreneurs are now more engaged. They understand what they need to do uh, to an extent, and they're more excited. With this government reform, we see more uh, e-government services that really cuts down the time of a lot of uh, that, that was consumed uh, previously by entrepreneurs. We do also see uh, brave initiatives from the government as, uh, for example, introducing the entrepreneurial license to allow for foreign investment to come into Saudi. This actually is very healthy for our Saudi economy. It creates more healthy competition for our entrepreneurs that brings in uh, great ideas from the global community. Uh, also, I would want to add, for example, the financial support that's uh, been uh, also uh, seen. For example, the establishment of the Saudi venture capital company. This allows for a $1 billion fund to participate in the arena. Uh, through that fund, we've seen a lot of VCs come into play in Saudi Arabia. This, um, this allows for the entrepreneurs to actually do their homework, prepare their pitch decks properly, and know that they will be challenged by these VCs. And this puts more pressure on the entrepreneurs, but it improves the quality as we go. Uh, in addition, we see a lot of angel investment networks uh, coming into play. From a non-financial side, we see entities like Munshaat coming up with a lot of awareness programs, such as BBAN, for example. MISC is also participating with their competitions. Um, I think that one of the most important things is the mindset, mindset shift that is happening in society. Uh, no longer is the government uh, the only refuge for making a living. The youth right now understand that becoming an entrepreneur is an option. I think with all of the reform, with all of the changes, uh, it's just given the youth a practical uh, opportunity to dream big. Thank you very much. Uh, Follow-up question to Mohammed, to you, because we were talking about investment and Saudi venture capital company. So what does the in investment context for entrepreneurs look like right now in Saudi Arabia? How is it, it has changed? What has government done? What has Munshad done? And what are you looking forward, what are you going to do about it? Excellent. First of all, thank you, Dr. Romy. Thank you, esteemed guests, for being here. Uh, and uh, I'm very happy to be part of this uh, panel. And thank you to MBSC for inviting us and Cake and Babson Global. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the investment context, uh, it has been very slow uh, in the past, where you don't see many uh, deals happening. You don't see many uh, VCs being created. However, in the recent, uh, in the past year or year and a half, uh, after the establishment perhaps of uh, Saudi Venture Capital Company, which is an uh, uh, initiative that was led by our uh, funding uh, sector and Munshiat, uh, it, and its goal, as, as uh, Ms. Maha uh, mentioned, is uh, it's, it's a $1 billion fund, and with the goal to incentivize VCs to start uh, opening uh, and start uh, uh, investing uh, in a co-matching manner or in acting as an anchor investor. Uh, so this has really in incentivized investors 
whether it's uh, VC funds or even angel investors uh, to start focusing on uh, on, on investing, on utilizing their investments in, uh, uh, in, in startups. And you see that attracted family offices, attracted uh, women entrepreneurs and women investors, attracted uh, existing uh, firms uh, or capital companies to, to, to establish a fund. Uh, uh, as well as there is, the PIF has established recently even uh, another uh, fund, which is JEDA, and that also has further incentivized uh, local and even international uh, VCs to, to participate in this ecosystem. Uh, we also have worked on many uh, initiatives that, uh, okay, there, is, there are investors, there is money. Uh, now, where is the deal? Uh, so so uh, to, to get those industries or those investors uh, in the country, you, they need to see deals happening. So we have developed multiple programs with, uh, from early stage from university startups uh, as, as uh, from idea to MVP, MVP to startup, startup to growth, growth to further growth. Uh, to, and the, my, the main point of this, those activities is to attract those investors, uh, to give them a healthy pipeline, more options, uh, various sectors. We have uh, uh, launched more than eight uh, different uh, accelerator programs in eight different sectors as Munshaat. And that's only, uh, Munshaat's role is not to, uh, to dominate or to, uh, to, to even lead, it's, it's to start. Uh, and the aim is to see the ecosystem taking this to, to further many levels ahead. Thank you very much. Um, Abdurrahman, um, you are the lead of entrepreneurship and innovation at MISC Foundation. So the next question from you is regarding innovativeness or innovation. How can government or private sector encourage more technology startups and um, innovative ventures in the kingdom? Because as I talked about it in, in, in my report presentation as well, that most of the businesses are consumer oriented businesses. There are very few technology oriented businesses. Absolutely. Well, first off, thank you so much um, to you, LeJane, the rest of the incredible team at, at MBSC for this wonderful um, event. I was, I was personally lucky to be in the forum last year in person, this year virtually, and we'll always be looking forward to next versions as well. Um, I, th I think when it comes to questions about um, sort of like technology heavy or technology based startups, uh, w when you talk about a startup in general, uh, the main building block is the team itself. Uh, and when it comes to a technology based startup, uh, you need access to technical expertise. So only from that perspective, um, there's sort of like a need to go back in the beginning of the funnel uh, or the influx of that like technical talents and this is where kind of like education um, sector, as well as the general inspiration of young people to go down that route, uh, sort of comes in um, as a necessity. Um, universities often play an important role in encouraging people. And um, as Saudis, um, as, as someone from my own generation, I grew up uh, seeing sort of like a close uh, sort of collaboration between, for example, KFUPM, uh, King Fahad, uh, University for um, Petroleum and Minerals and, and Saudi Aramco, uh, where there was very close relationship and, and tight collaboration that resulted in, in, in great interest um, across the kingdom in, in pursuing um, STEM related degrees. Um, so, so that is from one side. The other is more on the inspiration that um, this is a viable path. This is uh, something that can often lead to uh, incredible successes for many startups. Um, and this can be by, um, you know, encouraging places like um, incubation based and, and technology based um, 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 kind of like innovation centers or by bringing uh, certain talents from outside, as you've mentioned, um, entrepreneurship is, a, is kind of like a, 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 a global sort of like um, feeling to it. The more you bring from the outside, the better the competitiveness and the level of innovation. So that is on one end, um, which really hopefully leads to more people taking um, the first step into their intention or action to start the startups. The other side, as far as technology um, based startups is how you can make sure they continue to grow um, as, as they scale. 
Um, things related to the environment are very specific to technology startups. So when you're, let's say you're starting a biotech company, very likely that your product will take many years until they get developed. Uh, so there's, 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 there's sense of um, the lead time for development that is way more than the typical consumer oriented businesses um, that often needs in order to maintain that level of success, um, certain access to facilities. So again, if you're a biotech company, you probably need access to a place where you can do clinical trials or access to certain labs. Uh, these are very costly from cost perspective and take a lot of time and, and need to access. Um, other things that might be relevant to uh, my colleague's point about investment uh, is that the more there is interest from the investment side into technology startups, the, the higher the likelihood that people would be interested in that. Um, in more developed ecosystem, you see that kind of like emerging trend of technology focused VCs, uh, just like the technology focused startups. Uh, so the more we encourage that path, uh, the likely that um, we will see more technology based startups, um, not only going to being launched, but actually uh, to continuing to grow. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, Ibrahim, uh, how has COVID-19 affected existing businesses and startup activity in Kingdom of Saudi Arabia? And you can talk about your own business as well. That's what I want to hear as well. First, uh, and dear all, good evening. Uh, I hope you all stay safe and stable health. Uh, many, thank, uh, many thanks to MBSC team and, uh, and for, for you, Dr. Rumi, specifically for the for the introduction. I really appreciate what you said, Dr. Rumi. Uh, regarding uh, the question, Dr. Rumi, uh, so COVID-19 for sure was a challenging uh, moment for many traditional businesses uh, such as, uh, uh, such as barber, sh uh, barber shops, cafes, and restaurants. And unfortunately, and many of them, uh, many of them, they went any bankrupt and, and closed. It was a challenging moment, specifically during the lockdown period. It was very challenging. And uh, while at the same time it it opened up opportunities for uh, for uh, uh, for uh, technology for technology companies and uh, such as e-commerce uh, businesses and also uh, logistic and also logistics market. Uh, uh, like for for example, uh, during uh, uh, during COVID uh, COVID nineteen time, uh, the numbers of sales. And demand on e-commerce market went uh, went really high, uh, went really up. Even that was not uh, expected and was not uh, managed by uh, logistics companies. Even the number of orders and exceeded their uh, capabilities, which shows that there is uh, there is a uh, there is a high potential in that market. And uh, we hope to see even the uh, I mean, we have we hope to see um, uh, more. Uh, uh, the, the, I mean, regarding the ecosystem to get better and better with time. And um, one of the main challenges, and, uh, as, as I say, and really, uh, this is what I personally faced uh, during, the, during the time. Um, it was not an issue of uh, acquiring uh, sales. The issue was is having the ability to deliver them to, to, to the customers. Uh, that was really challenging. And... Uh, and uh, also, um, also, I mean, uh, I think many of us got affected on their online orders. We have seen this impact. Uh, their orders got delayed, uh, even if you order them locally or uh, internationally. And the logistics market really got affected from, uh, uh, from the COVID-19 time. Thank you. Thank you, Ibrahim. Maha, uh, another quick question from you, that what step could entrepreneurs take to better ensure the ongoing success of their businesses? As you saw in my presentation, that yes, a lot of businesses are starting up, but then the, uh, the number of businesses which go into established form are uh, fewer as compared to the people who start their businesses. Um, well, Dr. Mohammed, I think it's uh, always very exciting to start a new business. You have a small team, you're pumped up, you're ready to uh, go on this exciting journey with your very small team. But as uh, you start to see success, you start to see a bigger team, bigger clients, uh, more hopefully return on investment, uh, you start to see more revenue. Uh, these are all good indications that the company is growing. 
Uh, but as you move into these uh, growing pains, if you will, uh, you will start to see uh, new challenges that start to face, face you. And I think these can be put into three main buckets. Maybe the first bucket would be the external uh, changes, uh, things that are related to labor market change, economical climate, uh, maybe government policy changes. Uh, all of these are different external uh, policies as your uh, changes, sorry, as your company grows. Um, internal changes uh, within, within the company itself, you'll start to uh, worry more about keeping your cash flow positive. You will uh, uh, have to deal with uh, recruiting a, a bigger team, maybe bringing in three people that are top talent. It's much easier than growing a, a bigger team that is of a top, uh, top talent. Uh, also looking at uh, different bylaws, different new government licensing, and, and just keeping up with all of that is, is different, is difficult. But I think um, for me personally, in my opinion, the most challenging of all of this is the third, which is the personal challenges as an entrepreneur, as a partner uh, uh, within, within a group uh, in this company. There are lots of ch psychological challenges, uh, some motivational challenges. I think entrepreneurs should revisit their commitment to uh, the essence of the company because, you know, when you start something, it's very different in, in six months. It's very different in two years. So you need to realign, reassess your level of commitment. Is it still aligned with your core values? Is it still aligned with your core why you started uh, started this business. So a revisit to your whys. Um, also, I think that entrepreneurs tend to uh, say that they're very busy and they kind of fall behind in personal growth and personal uh, education. And I think that there are different leadership skills that need to be acquired to grow a business. Uh, there, there is a lot of risk management that needs to take place. A lot of emotional intelligence because you're dealing with so many different opinions. You need to delegate a lot of the work because it's no longer just about you. It's about a much bigger company and people are depending on your business. Um, I think one of my favorite as well is really looking at foresight. And foresight is, is, is a science. Uh, you learn it in universities or in books. And with foresight, you tend to pay more attention to the signals of, of the surroundings. So you can better prepare. You can manage your risk. You can draw alternative futures for your company. Because, again, when you scale, it's a very different, uh, very, very different uh, ballgame. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mohammed, uh, another question from you that if there was an equivalent of Silicon Valley in Saudi Arabia, which region this would be? And are you doing something at Munsha to create that kind of cluster or Silicon Valley of Saudi Arabia? So, so yes, uh, Silicon Valley was not created in a day and night. Uh, and I don't think the US government or state of California has uh, led that creation. Uh, looking at that as an example, perhaps if you see the heart of Silicon Valley would be having uh, the uh, educational institutions, the research centers, Stanford, uh, and it wasn't in San Francisco, the main city, it was where Stanford is. Uh, and then it, it organically started to grow around that. Uh, and and it's, as I said, it's one example, and you can see there are uh, many global other examples, and even in the U.S. there are other good examples of, of an ecosystem being created. Uh, as Munshaat, and, and, and I think the results of Jim uh, even, even uh, assures us that there are ecosystems being created. Uh, you can see, perhaps, I would take Riyadh as an example, uh, to, to create an ecosystem of, like similar to uh, this, the uh, Silicon Valley or even no, more recently Berlin or uh, Seoul in South Korea. Uh, uh, it starts with having education institutions uh, where you can see in Riyadh perhaps we have the most uh, in, 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 in the uh, uh, geographical uh, or suburban area of, of Riyadh as a city. Uh, you, you start to see uh, demand as access to market, uh, access to investment, 
and investment would come in any way. Wherever there is good opportunities, investment will be easily mobilized. Uh, you can also see the access of the, uh, the incubators, accelerators, and it starts, I think, in my opinion, starts small. And we've seen this perhaps in, uh, in, in Seoul, in South Korea, where uh, there is a, 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 they call it Tehran Valley. There is a Tehran Avenue where they started having the largest incubator there, and then it started becoming uh, all incubators and all business startups being started there. And I, act, I actually see that in the past two years where we, we started to see the first co-working spaces uh, in, in, in Anas, uh, Anas Bin Malik Street uh, or Road, and now you can see perhaps more than 10 other uh, new uh, co-working spaces being opened in the same uh, street and that's starting and that's close to the different universities, close to the uh, business community and we, we will see this happen. We will see this okay. happening uh, and starting from Riyadh and then perhaps depending on the different sectors and verticals that cities uh, tend to, to, to have as a feature, you'll see that happening in Jeddah in a different sector and Khobar in a different sector and then uh, we will have those cities hopefully inshallah soon. Okay, uh, my last question is from Abdurrahman. Abdurrahman, what advantages do young people have when it comes to starting a new business and what challenges they are facing as compared to older people? Um, so I don't, I don't think really there's any kind of like age discrimination per se. I mean, there's no need to do that. But that said, if you were, let's say an investor, um, because you know the, the reason why I use them as an example because they're the most capable people of making like decisions with emotions aside and and one that would make the most business sense um and you were called for a meeting to listen to a great idea and you probably come to the meeting and then there's um a 21 years old um with an idea obviously you want to make this succeed but the first probably few questions that would come to mind is um, you know, do they have the right experience? Um, do they have the business connections? Because uh, I don't want to only bring my own network of connections. I want this to be uh, part of it from me, part of it from them. Um, when we hire a team, can he or she manage that team? Maybe they haven't managed the team before. Uh, so these are like some of the questions that might present, um, you know, some stigma against young people when sort of like when you take this to the other side, to the uh, relatively older um, entrepreneurs, uh, kind of like one of the questions is, you know, what probably like, do they have the time? Um, you know, a young person probably has all the time, but as, as you get older, you get busier. And so this is one of the questions that you might have in mind. Um, are they flexible enough with the ideas? Um, you know, with with the breadth of their experience and the depth of it, probably have developed some form uh, of like or an approach or and and way of doing things. You know, what if their time comes and and we decide to pivot that business to a new direction? Will we be able to easily get along and be flexible in that transition? Uh, so these are some of the ideas. And and while they cannot and should not define who you are, even if it's a larger group that you belong to. Um, I think I think there is definitely certain advantages to each group. Um, young people have um, a, a sort of like a fresh mind, um, a curiosity and openness uh, to learn, and and that sense of kind of like business innocence, where um, where you're really open to any idea and really open to doing what you want. When older people um, kind of like possess more of the experience, more of the network. Um, you know, uh, probably a record of accomplishments and failures, all of them can only be an asset to them. Um, but at the end, I think, I, I think you just want to make sure that you get the best of both. This is the, the successful entrepreneurs, you see them possessing both. So, so you see them with experience and then you see them open to learn as well. Excellent. You guys are so inspiring. I want to keep on listening to all of you, all four of you. But I have been told that the time is up five minutes ago. So I have to uh, stop here and uh, go back to Lejean, who has some questions from the audience. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Rumi. All right, so I have a question for uh, Ibrahim. How did you manage to grow your business during COVID-19? If you could give us two quick uh, or three quick uh, ways. Um, so during COVID-19 period, uh, 
what the challenge was is to be able to have your order fulfilled to the customers. So uh, one of the main challenges that we faced is uh, that delivery companies, they are not, they are no longer able to, to deliver, uh, to deliver the, the, the orders on a timely manner uh, with our promise to the customers. So one of the things that we, we have built during that time is uh, a board, we called it uh, the board of logistics. This is what we called it in, in, in our company. So this board, uh, we just, uh, we just uh, did some algorithms that continuously check uh, the order status from all the companies that we are dealing with. We have opened up accounts with all the logistics companies that are available uh, and providing service from uh, our warehouse area. And then it keeps just uh, continuously checking uh, order statuses. And then it found us like, uh, and, then just, yeah, and then we just got uh, for each different city and for specific weight of products, which shipping company is that order should go with. So with that, we, we provided yeah, a technological solution that helped us in, in our journey. Yeah. Excellent. So you basically wore your entrepreneurial hat to solve a big problem that the whole country was facing in terms of logistics. That, 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 uh, that solution, yeah, and we really worked yeah, and hard on it and with, it, had, it had a lot of uh, uh, any analysis part and then alhamdulillah, and we managed to find a solution at the end. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Ibrahim. Allah uh, Ms. Maha, a quick question for you. In your experience, what are the main characteristic, uh, character qualities of a successful entrepreneur? Very good question. One of my favorite questions. Um, I think one of the top is actually having a growth mindset. Uh, that means that I am resilient. I am ever learning. I continue to learn. I have emotional intelligence. It's, it's, it's someone who is uh, very much aware of their external environment and also very much aware of their inner environment and uh, has good skills working with people. I think uh, as a founder, you need to be resilient. Uh, there are lots of challenges that are gonna be coming on your, on, in your way. And every time you fail, you learn and you stand up and you continue your path. I think that's one of the top uh, qualities. The other one is emotional intelligence. So you know how to communicate, you understand body language, uh, you know how to uh, negotiate through that. And, uh, and then the third is really obviously financial awareness, uh, really understanding your financial status, when to fold, when to continue, when to expand, all of that, like the business acumen is, is really important as well. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Dr. Rumi, I was wondering if we can ask one more question uh, to the whole uh, panel. We'll get a quick answer from each one of them. So uh, I think we could, we have to move to the another one, but thank you very much to all the panelists. Uh, we really enjoyed your presence here and it was really um, worth listening to you, uh, all of you with your experiences. Thank you very much. Pleasure is mine. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you very much. much. Over to you, Lujain. Uh, thank you all very much. Now we are going to begin sharing a presentation from Dr. Donna Kelly. Dr. Donna Kelly, uh, she's a professor in entrepreneurship at Babson College and holds the Frederick C. Hamilton Chair for Free Enterprise. Since 2007, she has served as a board member of the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor and she leads the GEM United States team. She has also co-authored 29 GEM reports. Dr. Kelly is joining us all the way from the United States to share the findings of the first ever KSA Women Entrepreneurship Report. We're very excited to hear what you have, Dr. Donna. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, thank you so much. And um, my only regret is I can't be there with you all in Saudi Arabia. I remember the event last year um, it, was, it was just really enjoyable to meet everyone. Um, it's about maybe as hot here as it is in Saudi Arabia. We're having a, a quite a warm summer. So I hope that 
everyone is safe and um, taking some time to, to enjoy the, the summer before school starts up. Um, I'd also like to thank my co-author, Alicia Koduras, uh, who really led on this report. Um, her analysis skills are, are really unmatched and um, her responsiveness is, is amazing. She, you can email her at, in the middle of the night and, and she'll be uh, responding within a few minutes. I uh, also would like to thank Moonshot and the World Bank who provided a lot of feedback on this report and a lot of context to help explain some of these results. Um, this is a really exciting report and I have to say I've been involved in GEM probably 13 years, um, highly involved at, at a global level as well as leading the US team. And I've really seen over time in the most recent years that there's such a huge interest in the Middle East in entrepreneurship right now. And I think it's just, it's really encouraging. And, um, you know, I congratulate all of you that have participated and contributed to that, even as, as entrepreneurs or as um, customers, suppliers, financers, any, uh, just even boosting the attitudes of entrepreneurship in society. So let me start with four basic themes that are really important that we need to pay attention to when uh, maintaining and growing entrepreneurship among women in Saudi Arabia. First of all, the attitudes and inspiration are, are really important and you'll see some really interesting results on that. We also need to ensure that women are able to participate across all phases. Now we can measure this in GEM as you saw in the previous presentation, we can look at um, if people are interested in starting businesses, are they actually taking the steps to start? If they take the steps to start, are they able to transition their businesses to a mature phase? The other thing that's important too is it's not just the number of entrepreneurs we need to pay attention to. It's the impact, the overall impact they have on society. Now we know there'll be a lot of one person businesses in any economy, but when you look at a macro view, you want to ensure that entrepreneurs are contributing toward um, industry diversification, innovation, um, technology, growing and uh, job creation. And then finally, we need to think about the support for women entrepreneurs and the conditions in the environment that, that help women start up and sustain their businesses. So let's look first at attitudes. So the blue bars represent um, women's ratings on on these attitudes. And these are actually done uh, for the entire sample. So these are not just the entrepreneurs, but all women in Saudi society, all men in Saudi society, um, according to the sampling. So as you see here, women have a, a high degree of regard for entrepreneurship in terms of the status they believe entrepreneurs are conferred, as well as favorable media attention being represented in the media. And they also believe a majority that entrepreneurship represents a good career choice. So as you can see, these blue bars are a little bit higher than the orange bars. Um, and that probably reflects what Professor Rumi mentioned was the high rates of, of women's entrepreneurship that we're seeing now. So let's look at other attitude measures. And these are more like self-perceptions, but actually going from left to right, uh, knowing entrepreneurs, first of all, is really important because they can serve as mentors, even just role models. They may participate in your business in some way, maybe as suppliers, maybe as advisors, um, board members, and so forth. So this is a really important indicator. And as you can see, a, a majority of women know an entrepreneur personally. A little bit less than men, but not much. Um, Fewer, although still a substantial amount, believe they have the capabilities to start a business. 69, almost 70% see opportunities. Again, a little bit more than, than what we see among men. Um, and that's really great. The one concern is that 46% of these women would not start because of fear of failure. And this is also high among men. So even compared to other countries, uh, fear of failure is something that we may pay attention to, to in Saudi Arabia. So what is the risk-taking um, propensity? So it can be factors such as 
Um, what happens when your business fails? Are you personally responsible? We see that in some countries around the world. Um, what are the cultural impacts if, if your business fails? So a lot of different factors could contribute toward that fear of failure. We also see on the, the bars to the right that fewer um, women than fewer women believe that it's easy to start a business and it's a little bit higher than than uh, men but that's probably something we should look at in both genders so now let's look across phases first of all as you know from the previous presentation uh, saudi arabia had the highest gender male uh, female to male gender ratio so women were starting at 14.7%, men were starting at 13.4% in 2009, and that's the highest ratio among the 50 economies that participated in the adult population survey in GEM in 2019. Saudi Arabia has the, uh, is actually on par with Qatar, um, but higher than other countries in the Middle East that, that were, were in GEM. Um, a little bit lower than the United States. We've actually in the US have seen entrepreneurship grown, growing gradually since 2011, since we emerged out of the, the financial crisis of 2007 and 2008. But really good uh, participation rates uh, compared to other countries in the region. So we look at longitudinally, these are the four years that we have had continuous participation in GEM. Uh, by Saudi Arabia. And as you can see, the orange line, um, men did tick up to about 15% in, in 2018, and then went down um, slightly in 2019. Um, what we, we tend to see is some variation year to year that is just due to noise in the data. Um, but the fact that women saw a, um, an over five percentage point increase is really remarkable. And that will be something to look at in 2020. I know we're gonna have the COVID uh, that's really factoring in on the results in 2020. So that may uh, be something we have to consider. We may uh, see some really abnormal results, but um, very encouraging results and reflecting a lot of um, emphasis on women's entrepreneurship in the kingdom. Now here's where we can look across phases and see that among those women that would like to start a business or intend to start in three years, how does that compare with those actually taking the steps to do so? So as you can see, consistently intentions have been higher than, than TEA, which represents total entrepreneurial activity. So again, these are the women that are in the process of starting or running a new business less than three and a half years old. So this is something also to look at, um, that gap between those that want to start and those that, that want to get started. And we think about that in light of the ease of starting business, how that was a little bit lower than some of the other attitude measures. Again, something that we might think about is what are the constraints? Another interesting um, result is when we look at TEA, um, relative to business closures, there are actually more people that have closed a business in the last year than are running a mature business. And uh, the established business activity has been um, consistently a little bit low in, in Saudi Arabia. So this is a mature business ownership that is, uh, the, the businesses are three and a half years or older. So let's look at the motivations. Um, really interesting gender differences. First of all, if you look all the way to the right, the most common reason people start is to earn a living because of job scarcity. We can equate this with necessity entrepreneurship that um, people are taking income earning into their own hands uh, if jobs or good jobs aren't, aren't as available. But perhaps the biggest gender difference we see is in the second set of bars to build great wealth or, or very high income. So as you can see, there's a big gender difference where it is um, well over two thirds of men are motivated by wealth to start their businesses, whereas um, over just over half of women are motivated that way. For both genders, 
um, making a difference in the world. That could be having great impact by starting a very impactful business. It can be social motives. Um, that's less of a motivation. Um, and then also continuing a family tradition. Still though substantial. So now let's look at impact characteristics. So first of all, uh, interesting results, but not surprising when uh, we look at also other countries. Women tend to more often start consumer-oriented businesses. Now, this can be a wide variety of, of businesses that are selling direct to consumers, um, but more often than not, they tend to be in areas where the barriers to entry are small, so it's easy to get in. Maybe it doesn't require a lot of finance, um, but they can often be very crowded competitively and hard to maintain the business. So this is also something to look at. We'd like to see a little bit more sector diversity among women. We see a little bit more um, among men. And another uh, thing to point out is uh, innovation. Now, I know Dr. Rumi and um, Professor Alicia had also mentioned uh, innovation levels. And both the male and female results are pretty similar. So 88% of women entrepreneurs are not introducing innovations. Often in many societies, and I actually see this in China um, several years ago, where uh, the market is growing so, uh, so greatly that um, innovative, you, you know, you could sell um, lots of products and services and innovation is not really required. Um, whereas sometimes in very competitively intense industries and regions of the world, um, you often have to introduce innovations in order to sustain your business. But this is gonna be increasingly more important in Saudi Arabia as the markets develop, as technology develops, and as, as entrepreneurs and established businesses become more innovative. Okay, this one is I think very encouraging. So when we look at the bars here, these are the current employees. So 79% of women entrepreneurs are employing six or more people, even at the startup, even in these early phases, less than three and a half years. So, um, and that's even uh, possibly more than, than what we see among males. So um, this has important implications for policy in that job creation is really important. Entrepreneurs create jobs. So when we see that right off the, that, as we would say in the United States, or, or right at, as at the startup phase, we're already employing people. And then we also, in GEM, measure growth expectations. Um, well, we know that entrepreneurs tend to be more optimistic. Um, established business owners um, have past data to look at. They, they can better predict their future, and they might have reached more of a uh, stable phase in their business where they don't project as much hiring. Um, but still, it's important that 75% of women entrepreneurs are expecting to create jobs in the next five years. It's likely that if somebody has grown their business, they have that amb ambition to do so. So these ambitious entrepreneurs are really, really important to pay attention to. So finally, building support for women entrepreneurs. So let's look at startup capital. Women entrepreneurs raise a median of 70,000 SAR, SAR, and um, that's less than what men raise, but probably um, a more in interesting um, finding is that they don't provide all that financing themselves, that they look to others to provide the rest of that startup funding. So not only are men raising more, but they're funding most of their startup capital themselves. So where do women get their startup capital? So you see here in the blue bars, the most likely source of capital is family members. For men in the orange bars, you see really a, a diversity of sources. So men really tap um, a lot of different sources for financing, whereas women tend to look more often at, at family. Now let's look at the investor side. Do women invest in entrepreneurs? Yes, they do. 14% of women provided funds to entrepreneurs and 15% of men did, so it's pretty close. Now, who did they invest in? Most of the time, it's a close family member or some other relative, as you can see in the bars 
on, on the, the left-hand side. Okay, where does this leave us? I wanna leave us with a couple of conclusions. Um, first of all, things are changing so rapidly in Saudi Arabia, especially when I think about it relative to the United States. Of course, things are changing really quickly right now in the United States as well, but typically um, you don't see as rapid change as, as what we're seeing in the kingdom. And um, that's really great. We tend to think of the change in the environment as happening over time. There are things that we can do pretty quickly, like maybe start up a, a finance fund, um, offer a training program, things like societal impressions, um, the impact of government policies, that might take time. And that's important to always pay attention to. In the meantime, it's important to equip women with the best ability possible to overcome the barriers that they may specifically encounter. So what we need to do and continue to do is to continue to transform these positive attitudes and intentions into entrepreneurial outcomes to get women to be able to start the businesses that they would like to start. Actually for both genders, we need to address fear of failure, but see if there are some gender differences for why this high fear of failure might exist. We can look at regional differences and opportunities um, and I'd also like to say that one thing that, that I've learned writing uh, multiple women's entrepreneurship reports uh, globally is that oftentimes women have a different industry profile, yet they're still innovative as much as men. And so one thing that we might think about is how does finance, um, how does education expertise, the building of expertise, how does the, the different support mechanisms think in terms of of innovation? Is it always technology where we're seeing huge innovations in healthcare right now and in education? So what we might do is try to understand that women might start in different industries, yet they are very innovative. And what support do they need to, to be able to grow those businesses? Ensuring the long-term viability. So as we mentioned for actually both genders that um, the established business rates were relatively low relative to the high entrepreneurship rates. And so what are the things that enable um, women as well as men to, to keep their businesses ongoing? Because that provides stable jobs. It provides reliable products and services for customers, returns to investors, um, customers for suppliers and so forth. So that's really important. Job creation and innovation, sector diversity, all these impact characteristics are especially important on a macro um, level. We want entrepreneurs of all kinds, right? We're gonna have the small entrepreneurs, we're gonna have the necessity entrepreneurs, but we wanna make sure that there's enough job creation and innovation, um, even global competitiveness coming out of the entrepreneurs in Saudi Arabia as a whole. So ecosystem conditions, we might think in terms of university education, maybe I'm a little biased because I'm at Babson and working with MBSC. Um, we at Babson have developed a lot of entrepreneurship curriculum and, and programs and events and mentoring for women and it's been very successful. Um, finance, as I mentioned, why do women entrepreneurs raise less money and why are they more dependent on family? Oftentimes entrepreneurs do tap their own personal sources and the people they know, but we could look at that. And also, as I mentioned, look at uh, finance relative to industries. And then evaluate other conditions. So we have a lot of great um, national expert survey results from GEM, but we could look at how do those conditions affect gender equity. So I want to end it here and uh, thank you. Thank you all the sponsors and my co-authors and, and everybody participating here. And I'll turn it back to you, Lujane. Thank you, Dr. Donna, for a very insightful uh, session and very exciting to learn for the first time what is happening in the Saudi ecosystem. Um, for in terms of women, sorry. <laughs> And coming up now, we will have a, another panel discussion. One second. There we go. Coming up now, we will have our next panel discussion with Dr. Rumi. Dr. Rumi, if you can please join me and introduce our panelists. Okay. Thank you very much, Lejane. I hope uh, that you can hear me. 
Um, we are, I, I feel blessed that I am introducing this Women Entrepreneurship Panel as well, uh, in addition to GEM Report Panel as well. So uh, this panel uh, is a special, Women's Entrepreneurship Report. We are going to discuss the results and other, uh, other stuff as far as uh, women's entrepreneurship is concerned in the kingdom. My first panelist is a co-founder and partner of TRAX, which is the leading communication network in the Middle East and North Africa, with 15 offices in 14 countries. Ms. Sara al Ay, who is also the Vice President of National Entrepreneurship Committee of the Council of Saudi Chambers, Board Member of Jeddah Chambers and Board Member of Women's Council for Saudi Chambers. Thank you for being with us, Sara. The second panel member is the director of Women's Entrepreneurship Department at Munshad, where her role is to increase women's contribution to the social and economic development of the kingdom. Ms. Afnan al -Babtain. And uh, my third panelist today is the founder of Niche Arabia, the kingdom's premier luxury marketing firm. And she is also the author of Under the Abaya, the kingdom's first street style book featuring diverse Saudi fashion scene and progressive Saudi women. And I'm pleased to uh, also let you know that Maryam is part of the prestigious Business of Fashion 500 list for two consecutive years. I welcome Ms. Maryam Musalli. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you. And there is a gentleman on the panel as well. And I am envious that there is a gentleman on Women's Entrepreneurship Panel. So I wanted to know that what it takes to be on the panel of Women's Entrepreneurship Development. And when I was reading through his bio, I found that he is the founding chairman of Okal Group, chairman of the Rea Vulture Capital, he is chairman of Sabaro, the Bravo Czech Re Rehabilitation Center. All these are organizations. And he's also the board member of Dala Health Company, Kazim Cement, Cement Company, Saudi Home Loans, Lendo, Rizal, Hala, Al Mehbaj, and many more. So that is the criteria for anybody who wants to be part of on Women's Entrepreneurship Panel next time, and he is a gentleman. So I welcome Mr. Faris Al Rashid on this panel as well, and I'm Thank really, uh, yeah, and I'm really um, pleased that all four of you have accepted our request, and you are here on panel, and we are here to learn from all four of you. And uh, let's start with Sarah. Sarah, my first question from you is that. Uh, how do you uh, account for the dramatic increase in the women's participation in entrepreneurship and, and closing of the gender gap uh, incrementally? We have not closed the gap, but incrementally it is uh, closing down. What is your opinion? And what, can, and what can other countries learn from KSA as well? This is also very important. Um, hello, everybody. Dr. Rumi, thank you for... Uh, for uh, uh, hosting this panel. It's a pleasure to be here. I hope my voice is clear. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know what's wrong with the video. It's just working and then it stopped, but I'm, I'm checking the technical uh, issue. Okay, to answer your question, we're talking about the dramatic increase in women's participation in entrepreneurship and closing the gender gap. If we want to look at uh, how this increase has happened, we have to see the new business opportunities, the diverse and new opportunities that came on board, such as culture, tourism, logistical support, healthcare, it's really opened up a lot, of, um, uh, a lot of new businesses that came on board, and especially with the diversity of the educational sectors, that had a major impact on women's increase in the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Okay? What other thing that we've seen is also the ease of regulations and the amendments within the commercial registration platforms and categorizations. That has helped where online, uh, easing regulations, identifying new uh, or um, uh, easier, ease of uh, efficient manner in which women, uh, entrepreneurs in general, can um, access the needed licensing and so forth with new uh, organizations coming on board, okay? 
However, what I'd like to say is closing the gender gap is not based only on women entrepreneurs opening businesses, but rather it's also the inclusion of more women in the workforce and the empowerment. And the empowerment of women within, within these various upper management, directors, leadership positions, because the more you have women in leading positions, the more you'll be able to um, develop opportunities for women to enter into the workforce because the, where, wherever the decision comes from, wherever the, the agreements come about, if women are not on those boards, then it will not have the impact necessary for women to be able to grow within the various sectors. Uh, promoting women's access to management and leadership positions is very important. And if we just look at the G20 report from Japan in 2019, it stated the, glo the goal is to reduce the gender gap in the labor force by 25%, okay? Where it's still a challenge facing Saudi Arabia. We're not there yet, we're working on it, but it is a challenge that, um, that needs to be addressed. And as we know that there's a great strides are being witnessed on that, on, that, um, on that level. However, more and more women are being appointed to leadership positions and governmental positions that assesses the needs of this inclusive growth that brings uh, more women into the workforce and into the entrepreneurial sector. Thank, thank, thank you, Sarah. One important thing which you mentioned is about financing. And as uh, my colleague, Professor Donna, was talking about that women are getting less money as compared to men. And I think Faris is the right person to ask this question, that what is the funding climate for women in the, in the kingdom right now? What interventions are being done, if any? And what more would help? Over to you, Faris. Uh, thank you, Dr. Romi, and uh, it's my pleasure to be uh, in this panel uh, with this distinguished uh, ba women panelists. <laughs> and uh, uh, also, thank you for uh, MBS College for uh, this report, and uh, I hope that we see more of these uh, reports in Saudi Arabia. Uh, as an investment, maybe I will, um, you, you, you have to make a difference. I think in your report say that more of, of the business for women is in, in the consumer and it's not in the tech uh, side. Uh, what, uh, which, is, which is normal when they go to this uh, consumer uh, uh, business. But when I, can, when I see it in our uh, venture capital fund or in Oqal, which is uh, normally it's a tech company, uh, I don't think there is a difference between uh, a woman founder or uh, a man founder and uh, deciding uh, which, uh, which one will get more. Uh, it is the same. Uh, if, if she or he had a very good uh, startup company, uh, then, then we will invest, of course. Uh, and uh, the, the term sheet and others, I don't think will be a different term sheet for a woman. Uh, and there is a term sheet for a man, if he's a man. And so uh, there is no uh, different in, in this. And uh, just to, to show you, I can see that uh, in the last two years, uh, there is a growing and in, uh, in, in women uh, founding and co-founder and startup company. And I can see it uh, in Uqal and our uh, uh, Jiraiya Ventures also. Uh, just uh, to give you an example, in, 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 uh, uh, we have Uh, and uh, I think most of the company, 50%, more than 50% of the work are women. Uh, so uh, really, uh, we can see a shift, we can see a growth of uh, women working in tech companies. They are uh, taking uh, a very, they are taking actually um, um, a, 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 a level of uh, high, uh, high level, uh, taking a high uh, level in, in the company and uh, see, and we can see them co-founder or, uh, or operation manager. Uh, having these uh, women and this work uh, uh, with, with these startup companies, I think it's, it will make them easier for them to start a new company when they work and a, uh, in a startup company. 
And I can see that uh, for us, it's easier to hire a woman in the company, in a startup company, rather than hiring men in a startup company because they want to, uh, they want to work in, in a new venture. They want to uh, start uh, with a new company. It's, um, uh, I mean, we, we, it's, it's a growing uh, and uh, we can see it. Uh, also in Uqal, maybe Sara, she's also uh, with us in Uqal, Jeddah, she saw that. Uh, we can see also in Uqal that most of, um, before we, we didn't have a lot of uh, uh, angel uh, investor, women angel investor, we don't have uh, startup, more of a startup, uh, women startup, uh, starting a company. Today we can see that. And I think uh, MESC also with 500, what they did in accelerating and uh, flat six and other accelerator makes more of um, uh, having a new uh, women founders and co-founders in, in these uh, uh, programs. Thank you very much. Um... Maryam, you are uh, um, exposing the positive image of Saudi women. And uh, the next question which I have drafted for you is that in your opinion, what contributes to the positive impressions about entrepreneurship in KSA for women? For example, uh, are there any women entrepreneurs who are role models or women leaders who are highly visible to inspire women to come into the entrepreneurship arena? Okay. Well, I think, you know, any young professional seeing success stories is going to be inspired by that. But I think especially more so for a young Saudi woman, you know, uh, we've been facing a lot of societal taboos, you know, from not showing our faces to not even revealing our name. Um, and then you fast forward to today where, mashallah, we have so many examples, so much so that I've, you know, made a book, not even one, but two. Um, and that idea of under the abaya is giving those women a platform to narrate their story and to inspire the next generation. Um, and, you know, as Dr. Donna said in her presentation, it's all about this self-perception. And what's changing that self-perception is by seeing yourself in these other women. Um, you know, for example, take, you know, Rima, Princess Rima bin Bender, you know, speaking at Davos, you know, here's a strong, calm confident, articulate Saudi woman. I mean, that can inspire anyone no matter where they are in their career. And I think, you know, these kinds of girl boss stories are awesome catalysts for our continued participation and, you know, progression in the workforce. Excellent. Uh, Afnan, uh, my next question is from you, that what Munshaat is doing to promote women's entrepreneurship specifically? First of all, I want to thank, uh, I want to thank you, Dr. Romi, and all the representative of uh, uh, MBS and the PAPS Global for all your effort and for undertake the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor for Saudi Arabia for Women Report as the first report uh, of its kind that help on giving an idea of, and also giving the guidelines how we will improve women participation in the economy. And uh, for your question regarding how we as a bunch at, uh, are doing to uh, increase the awareness of women entrepreneurship. As you know, the diversity and inclusion are the main co co are the main two concepts for the significant impact on the outlook of the economy. That's why we are doing uh, a mainstreaming activities within all the activities of Munshaat programs, starting off the intention of starting uh, a new businesses by doing a lot of activities in university, as um, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Hassan the, the VG mentioned, so the startup uh, programs. So we are targeting the both gender with a specific uh, uh, some of the, the uh, uh, with the gender lens of how we uh, increase the numbers of women in, uh, participating in these activities. This is one of uh, the examples. Also, we have Women in Business Network that aiming of doing different activities with the main stakeholders, such as uh, chamber of commerce all over the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia or the incubator and accelerator all over uh, the kingdom. And based the need of each cities and also based on the sectors are suitable for this city. Mm -hmm. So when we are going to uh, the north area is different uh, than we are talking in the in Riyadh or in in, in Shergia. 
So uh, this is in summary what we are doing on the uh, on the level of the intention of starting the business. Then also we are promoting entrepreneurship or the existing entrepreneurs how to scale their own businesses to the next level from micro to small by different interventions and uh, programs uh, and also uh, 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 facilitating uh, uh, receive the, uh, the suitable fund on any stage of their businesses. Excellent. Um, on the side, I am seeing the questions from the audience. So, uh, mashallah, there are questions from Japan and there are questions from Singapore and other countries as well. Uh, the, one of the very important questions which I have also thought about, that what particular challenges women do encounter in starting a business and then growing a business? And this question is specifically from Mariam and Sarah. So, Mariam, if you can go um, ahead and talk about it, and then, Sarah, I would like you to contribute to it as well. Sure. I mean, I think that, you know, just in terms of starting or growing your business, one of the obstacles that I can say is quite unique to, to start women, and I think this is on a global level, not just in Saudi Arabia, is that we're often underestimated. You know, the moment we walk into the room, you know, there's a lot of judgments of why we might be there, but it's not really, you know, we work completely, you know, underestimated in terms of what we can attribute to that project. And I always tell my team, you know, I have a team 14 girls and I tell them use that use that for your advantage you know use that naivety and then and then deliver because I think that's a tool that women can use in order to to you know make make a an imprint and I think that's one of the reasons that even niche to this day has you know some of the success and enjoys this market share is because of the fact that sometimes they think oh this is a small startup company you know young girls um, and then we're able to deliver um, and I think more on a logistical side you know some of the issues that we face you know specific to Saudi has been you know in terms of registering our company you know the these are, I mean, I remember when I started my company 10 years ago and I followed my dad from room to room, not really knowing what was going on. And, and at one point in that process, my dad was like, you know, just say yes about giving Faisal, some guy Faisal, my, you know, power of attorney for my company. And I think now, you know, with, you know, Vision 2030 and what's happening with our government and these policies, what's great to see is that women are now taking control again of their assets, of their companies. And I think that incentivizes a lot of us women to, you know, to delve into that entrepreneurship world. So I think, you know, seeing those changes, that's definitely helped those obstacles. Sarah? Thank you, doctor. Um, so what, what challenges are, uh, do women face as startups? Uh, it's twofold. In um, Saudi Arabia. We are talking about in, Saudi Arabia. I want to know. Saudi Arabia. We want to focus on Saudi Arabia, yes. Yeah. Well, we can talk about what we all see, whether it relates to everywhere, whether so it's mentorship, funding, and, and you know, access to market. But I really want to concentrate on the access to market part. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, kind of um, piggyback on what Maryam said years ago, what women used to face and where they are today. And up till 10, five years ago, a lot of times startups and women's businesses were considered usar muntija, which is productive families. So it's kind of reviewed, looked at as a charity, you know? So when you're mm -hmm. dealing with working with women and helping them support their business from a charity perspective, then, it's totally, then you're not really interested in getting them to go into market as much as, oh, let's help them out. And that's one of the mindsets that has been dramatically shifting and changing, and we're so happy to see this. And I think Munshaat played a massive role on this, so as other entities. But really what's also very important is revenue, supporting the revenue and not, and so giving them marketing, um, allowing them to have uh, access to markets, uh, being able to sell their product and, and being part of that competitive element versus just going in and saying, let's give money or let's um, host events for them to come and showcase what they do. No, it's make sure that they are uh, revenue positive and keep pushing on that. I just want to use an example of what's happening now in Lebanon and, um, and with the destruction and, the, and, the, and the, the, the horror that they've been through. But I've been doing a, um, a daily show for three days on Instagram Live with some of the entrepreneurs there. And the talk is, we don't want money. What we want is come and buy from us. From the smallest <laughs> grocery store to the businesses, as they're saying, so we're not looking for handouts or support or anything. What we want is come and buy from me and ensure that I am, you know, I, I have revenue, I have profits that are coming in, I will rebuild myself. I don't need that help as much as I need to stay in business. And that's what it is, is keeping women as a business. You know, women in business keep women in business. That's what's important. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Faris, the next question is from you, because you being the only gentleman on the panel and being a father, a husband, a uh, um, brother of, uh, of Saudi women, how is the culture changing in a way that could affect women's entrepreneurship? 
So what is your point of view? Uh, this is, uh, uh, I think this is a very important question. Culture is, uh, is making the difference uh, and it's clear in the last uh, two or three years, uh, the culture is different. Uh, the women, how they are um, taking a great job, uh, starting uh, companies, uh, working with, uh, with men. Actually, women today are taking our jobs. Uh, uh, we, we have uh, very good um, uh, women taking uh, CEOs. Uh, they are very good. In, uh, uh, so I think before we see women in Saudi Arabia are working in education and healthcare. They are not in, in the business. Uh, but in the last uh, years, I think, uh, it's clear that they are coming uh, and we are having a very smart and very difficult competitor. Uh, so uh, even um, we can see, and uh, as I told you, in the company, startup companies, that the women are, are more than, than men because we have a very good developers, uh, actually women developers, uh, especially in the company. You need the developers. Um, and uh, women's are very good in, in uh, designing, UX, uh, developing, uh, and they are more focused. And, uh, and when you give them something, they, they focus, and uh, I think they are focused more than, uh, than, than what we do. And uh, the other thing uh, is uh, what government is, is, is changing. We can see the, the program from Munshat, uh, SBC, the Saudi venture capital, uh, is putting more than two, I think, 200, 2.8 billion real. Uh, they are investing actually with us in Al and also in uh, uh, in uh, Daraya Ventures. Uh, actually, they are doing a matching program with SBC and and, and Al. So, if uh, a woman or a man is a founder and we are investing in, in a company, uh, SBC is matching the, 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 the matching the investment. And we can see the investment in Saudi Arabia. If you see the magnet report, uh, the last uh, report says that in the first half of 2019, uh, we have uh, more than the investment in whole 2019. So it's giving so you yeah, it's giving you that the funding, the more of entrepreneur are coming, and we can see it also in Uqal. In Uqal, we invested 18 uh, investment in 2019, and in the first half of 2020, we invested 10 uh, uh, startup in Uqal. And Sarah, uh, she's with us in, in Uqal, and she see, she knows that at the beginning when we start, we invest in two or three companies in, in one year and it was wow uh, today we are investing in 18 companies uh, and and hopefully we close more than 20 in 2020 uh, it's uh, because of the government is uh, uh, helping this uh, ecosystem and the last thing is what the ministry of uh, commerce did uh, with the new regulation the corporate law actually we are going to have a new corporate law uh, in Saudi Arabia, and it will it will help a lot women and men to start in a company. It's gonna be very easy because it's gonna be uh, you can start uh, a company as with a preferred share, uh, with the stock options, uh, uh, note, uh, uh, convertible note. We couldn't have this before uh, uh, with a venture capital and startup company. You cannot have it if you don't have something like this. And I think the government are uh, really changing uh, because uh, they see the entrepreneurship, they see the ecosystem need to change in this. And uh, actually the government are doing great job. So. Yeah. so if you allow me to say that because of the progressive leadership, entrepreneurial ecosystem is thriving and the culture for women's entrepreneurship development is also improving day by day. So the things which were taboos or no-go areas, even those things are being discussed 
and people are allowing their sisters and their 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 wives to go out and create their own world with their own name and their own image this is one yes. of the positive things because there are so many people i can see on the screen yeah. they have logged in from from different countries right now we have more than 15 20 country is uh, from outside saudi arabia who are here on the screen i can see so i want to let them know that things are changing and things are changing at ex exponential speed uh, in the last four years things have changed dramatically um Maria, yeah i know that you want to say something please yeah, I mean, I just wanted to say, like, for example, you know, my book Under the Bite, it's a nonprofit book that basically all the funds go to putting women in um, academic scholarships. And it's actually on its second edition. And I just want to share a quick story. When I first started the first book, I remember people were excited, really eager to participate in it, but there was still some hesitation, you know, in terms of revealing their name, showing their identity. You know, some of them wanted to be in the book, but let's say, you know, um, crop out their face so you couldn't tell. That shift within two years, guys, I can't, you know, explain, but every single person was like, where's my Instagram handle? I want to make sure my name's on there. I want to make sure my story's on there. So I think, you know, one thing that's important to know is that Saudi women have always been, let's say, performing. We've always been ambitious. We've been yes. either educating ourselves or working. But what's changed and what's really, and I think, you know, this attributed to our change, you know, um, with our government and everything, this, and this idea of this taboo is that now we're willing to own it. We're willing to own our ambition and an own, own our success. And I think that's what's super interesting. And that's that cultural shift that you're seeing, you know, in within two Two years, like you said, it's it's so transformative and so quickly. Yeah. Uh, there is a question which is running here, and that question is about foreigners and the laws that uh, to allowing foreign women who are uh, maybe here as uh, the dependents of some of the expatriates. And I think Faris has very rightly talked about it as well that there are a lot of changes in the corporate law as well. And I I know because during my research I have come across that yes. Um, a number of government entities are working to change a number of laws. And those laws, uh, some of those are already in public and some of those will be in public soon. And I think you will be hearing a very good news that the, whoever has given and, us and this also, question. Also, Dr. Romy, also for the international uh, entrepreneur, it's, today it's very easy that they can start to come to Saudi Arabia and start uh, a company through, and they can do it online. Uh, they yes. don't have to come to Saudi Arabia to. So the culture is promoting an entrepreneurship, yeah. not only uh, within the borders, but across borders as well. And, and Saudi Arabia. Sorry, uh, Faris, there was an overlap uh, because of the technology. Um, um, my next question is from Afnan. Afnan, how Munshad measure the progress of women entrepreneurs? Because this is uh, a very important uh, area. And what are you um, doing as far as sector diversity is concerned? So that all women are not into consumer sector or the business uh, services sector. Uh, this is a very important question for the diversity, which is, which is very important. And as you mentioned, there are a lot of women in the consumer field. So what we are doing by the awareness activities and looking to the challenges women are facing of not entering the new businesses in different sectors. So we have in Munchaat uh, a, a department which mainly focusing on looking for the opportunities on the 10 potential sectors uh, uh, mentioned in the semi national strategy. From our side, we do different interventions, starting up developing the regulations, such as on beauty sector, we develop the uh, the, uh, the regulation with the, with uh, the investors in this in this in this field, and also with the with the uh, government entities. Also in the daycare uh, sector, and also if we have, if, when we see like uh, uh, on the diversity, there are some of the sectors. Women, when she wants to enter, she can't find the right funding. We look to what kind of support we, we can uh, encourage those funding entities to support uh, women in this field. From that, uh, Kavala program developed different uh, uh, in incentives to encourage SME in general 
and women in specific to gain uh, the Kefala program, which is a financial guarantee to gain a fund from different funding entities of uh, from different uh, ent uh, funding entities in Saudi Arabia and they can enter and find those funding entities on uh, the, plat the platform which is uh, Munshaat initiated that you have all the funding entities of Saudi Arabia. And the percentage of women jumped to 60% in 2019, which previously was only 4%. When we go to the uh, second part of the question, how we measure, we have a Munshaat, a woman dashboard that we collect the data from the government entities. We, uh, so we can see the progress of women, entrepreneur, uh, entrepre uh, women entrepreneurs. Uh, uh, based on uh, the definition which uh, we have, whether it's micro or small or medium-sized business. So we have this dashboard and this will help us to participate with different entities that develop uh, research to see what's, uh, what's going on on, the, on uh, uh, women uh, entrepreneurship uh, in Saudi Arabia. Th yeah. Thank, thank, thank you, Afnan. Um, I just have to roll uh, it up because, um, and, but I have a last question. And this last question is from two women entrepreneurs who are on the panel. Education is very important for entrepreneurship, no doubt about it. A number of people have talked about it. A uh, number of research has been done. Uh, in, in Saudi Arabia, what do you think? What has been done and what needs to be done, especially at the university level, to promote entrepreneurship. Let's start with Sarah and I'll go with to, to, to Mariam then. What has been done? I wanna to go to what needs to be done. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's very important because a lot has been done previously, but what needs to be done is more inclusion. I think I want to use Corona and, uh, and the, the six months that we've been living where everybody's been in curfew, it's been quarantine period. We've seen a, a dramatic change on how education is, how uh, a consumer spending is, how businesses are. We've seen businesses go out of business, but we've also seen businesses that were able to readapt, reestablish themselves and, um, uh, you know, and grow. Uh, so one of the things I think is... Um, from an educational perspective is, is the education system changing? Is a university degree as important as it was uh, you know, five years ago? Or is it today a mix between both where I study, but I can also launch my own business? And, and we see this abroad a lot. Um, how will universities in Saudi Arabia today open entrepreneurial hubs that are supported by entities like Manshaat and like Aqal and like the Chambers of Commerce and the Ministry of Trade and so forth, where you can study, and especially if you're spending a lot of time online and virtual you know, distance learning, but you also are able to start, develop, get mentored, run your business, and then you can be, um, you graduate and you also have a profitable and healthy business that is able to be sustainable, growing, and maybe you know, expandable. So that's one. Number two is we have, uh, for example, the King Abdullah Economic City. So we have these amazing locations that can be used and turned into entrepreneurial hubs. So you're learning as you're growing your business. Um, how can we turn, uh, how can we do the next Silicon Valley? However, Silicon Valley was not built through government initiatives. It was mm -hmm. done as a grassroots level. So if we can develop an entrepreneurial hub in King Abdullah Economic City, where you are providing the venue, you're providing the logistical support, you're providing the residents, so people, you know, the entrepreneurs who, uh, who need that support, who today cannot pay the, the rent that is exorbitant in certain aspects, but they find a place that is fully ready for them to come in and they can be creative in their business, but have support to, to ensure that the background um, kitchen is, is ready. And, and, you know, and then these entrepreneurs can even be supporting each other. So you work together. And again, I want to go back and say today what we need is an inclusive growth. Munshaat Afnan had said it's all based on diversity and inclusion. If it's not inclusive, where you're covering all aspects, and that comes from education, from the private sector, from the public sector, from the government sector, that's the only way we can face um, the growth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Mariam, a quick answer to this. Sure, what can I, be done? I think I agree full heartedly with what Sarah was saying about this grassroots kind of movement, but I think a big emphasis on mentorship programs. You know, for me personally, growing, you know, expanding my business, those were people that were crucial in my life. You know, why I didn't get an investor when I first started my company is because one of another entrepreneur said, you know, if you started on your own, then don't have an investor. I mean, these kinds of advice that you get with that one on one, you know, interaction, I think are key. And I think that's one thing that we need to establish, especially being, you know, such a new country in terms of various fields 
fields that were opening up to women. Now it's about let's get the people that can actually mentor these people and, and have them work within our country. Because a lot of times, even these programs, they're abroad. And so that doesn't really have the same effect as having something you know, on, on, on Saudi land where we're dealing with Saudi customers and Saudi logistics and Saudi manufacturing. So I think you know, mentorship for me would be one of the key things. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and the gentlemen. Um, it was really a learning experience for me. I have been working in the area of women's entrepreneurship development for the last 20 years in different parts of the world, but I learned from all four of you. Thank you very much for uh, being here with us today. And inshallah, we will keep on learning from you and interacting with all four of you. Uh, you are inspirational, mashallah. Um, there were a couple of questions which I have asked you, but um, the organizers are asking me to roll it up because we are all, already 22 minutes uh, uh, over the time limit. Um, thanks to all of you, all the panelists, all the presenters, and all the listeners. There are quite a few from 20 more than 20 different countries all over the world. This is so inspirational. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed. And if you want to know more about us at Mohammed bin Salman College of Business and Entrepreneurship, you are most welcome to go on our website, download the reports. We will send you these reports by email as well so that you can go through them in detail. If you have any questions, please feel free to email us. We are at your disposal and we would like to interact with you in future as well. Thank you. Lujain, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Romi, and thank you to our esteemed panelists as uh, you gave us a lot of thought-provoking insights tonight. Um, with this final panel discussion, I would like to thank our audience for joining us tonight uh, for our first virtual GEM Report event here held in KSA. As Dr. Rumi mentioned, please visit our website, www.mbsc.edu.sa, to learn more about the college and our services and programs. You can scan the QR code available uh, right now on your screen, and we have our social media handles available as well. I would also like to thank our authors, our uh, presenters, our panelists for a very insightful and thought-provoking event. And finally, I would like to thank our partners whom without their support, this would not be. So I would like to thank Babson Global. I would like to thank Munshaat, Misk Foundation, Lockheed Martin, Cake, as well as the World Bank uh, for all of the support. And with this, I tell you, thank you and good night. Mm -hmm.